Ethan Berg is a special agent from Seattle who has been assigned to investigate the disappearance of two fellow agents, Evans and Kate. Following the leads, he, along with his driver, reach a city in Idaho and start looking around in their car. Unfortunately, when they are busy talking, a truck suddenly rams into them and the screen turns black. When Ethan wakes up, he finds himself in a hospital bed in the nearby town of Wayward Pines. A nurse, Pamela Pelcher, aka Pam, attends to him and reveals that his driver passed away in the accident. Strangely, the hospital is completely vacant, and Ethan is the only patient there. He asks Nurse Pam about it, to which she sarcastically replies that people in this town never get sick. Then, Ethan tries to call his family, but when he asks for his belongings, Pam reveals that the local sheriff has them. Back in Seattle, Ethan's boss Adam informs his wife, Teresa, that there's been a car accident. Though the body of the driver was identified, there was not a single trace of Ethan's remains in there. Hearing this, Teresa becomes upset, and she she shakily shares the news with their son, Ben. At the hospital, Ethan repeatedly asks for a phone so that he can contact his family, but Pam makes an excuse every time. Fed up, he rips out his IV, puts on his clothes, and leaves, despite Pam's protests. He then gets out of the hospital premises and wanders around the town, which looks like nothing peculiar at first sight. After a while, Ethan enters a bar, where the bartender, Beverly Brown, lets him use the phone. He immediately calls his wife, but the phone goes to voicemail, so he simply leaves a message. Before leaving, the kind Beverly hands him her address, saying he can visit her again if he needs help. Following this, as Ethan is walking down the street, he discovers that the crickets of Wayward Pines are just cricket sounds being played from speakers. This is the first indication that this town has something very strange going on. They could at least play some Taylor Swift. The next morning, an irate hotel clerk kicks Ethan out when he's unable to pay for his room. With nowhere else to go, he heads to the address the bartender Beverly gave him, but finds that it's eerily abandoned. When he ventures inside, he is shocked to discover a rotting corpse, which belongs to his friend Evans one of the special agents he came looking for. Wasting no time, Ethan reaches out to the local sheriff, Arnold Pope, and asks for assistance. However, the sinister cop cross-questions him about how he ended up here. Ethan explains everything, and also requests help to find the second special agent he came looking for, Kate Hawson. It turns out that Ethan and Kate were in a romantic relationship before she suddenly disappeared. As the two continue talking, Ethan suddenly remembers the nurse, Pam, mentioning that his belongings were taken away by the sheriff. So, he asks if he can have them back, but Sheriff Pope just scoffs and asserts that he doesn't have them. Left with no choice, Ethan uses the sheriff's landline and calls his family and boss, but in both cases, he can only leave them a voicemail message. Confused and desperate for answers, he returns to the bar from the previous day, looking for Beverly. However, to his surprise, the bar owner reveals that no woman by that name works there. Frustrated, Ethan starts to get aggressive, but the man knocks him out and calls someone for help. When Ethan wakes up, he finds himself in the hospital once more, where psychiatrist Dr. Jenkins approaches him and reveals that the accident has left him with a bleeding cerebrum. This is why he's experiencing disassociative breakdown. Hearing this, Ethan becomes enraged and denies being delusional, prompting the devious Pam to give him a sedative. She then proceeds to take him to the surgery room to have him operated on. But fortunately, Beverly arrives in the nick of time and takes him away. Together, they manage to attack Nurse Pam and get out of the hospital, hiding in a cemetery vault. Before the sedative completely knocks Ethan out, Beverly tells him that his friend Evan was killed for trying to escape. She also reveals that she ended up in the town in 1999, almost six months ago. Hearing this, Ethan is left in complete disbelief, as it is now 2014 in the real world, almost 15 years after Beverly vanished. This indicates that the time in this world works differently than the rest of the world. Several hours later, he wakes alone in the cemetery vault and wanders back into the town. Surprisingly, he spots a woman who looks like the missing agent he is looking for, his former partner and love interest. Kate. She is with her husband, Harold Ballinger, a local toy shop owner. Ethan covertly follows the duo to their house and rings the doorbell. At first, Kate pretends to not know him and acts strangely, but when she realizes that Ethan is not going to play along, she whispers, they're watching us, referring to a CCTV camera hidden under the ceiling fan. Kate then reveals that she has been living in Wayward Pines for 12 years, and this is why she looks a bit older. However, Ethan finds it impossible to believe, as he just met her five weeks ago. This 
indicates that time in Wayward Pines seems to work differently as people age rapidly here, trying to reveal the truth about the town. Ethan tries to bombard her with several questions, but Kate just tells him to leave, saying it's not safe here. After being ignored by his best friend and the person who he came looking for, Ethan decides he'd better make a run for it. He quickly steals a car and attempts to flee the mysterious town, but to his surprise, after every 20 minutes, he keeps on driving back into the town, as if it's connected in an endless loop. Taken aback, he gets out of the car and tries to find an exit in the woods. However, he finds a gigantic concrete wall with an electrified fence on top. The sign on the fence warns him to return if he doesn't want to die. Then we get an aerial view of the town, which turns out to be a mountain valley surrounded by concrete walls. Ethan once again gets in the car and tries to drive off, but this time, Sheriff Pope arrives and apprehends him. Just then, a teen cycles by the place and shouts, don't try and leave, Mr. Burke. That's rule number one. Rule number two is let the sheriff wear your underwear. Fortunately, Ethan is released with only a warning, and he is ordered to stay inside his hotel room. He spends a few hours there, but eventually gets bored, as the place has no computers or internet. Then he ventures out and reaches the same abandoned house, where he found his friend's body earlier. Surprisingly, the corpse is still there, despite his having informed the officials about it. As he investigates the scene, he finds a strange notebook in his friend's boot. But before he can keep it, Sheriff Pope arrives with a gun and scares him away. In the next scene, Ethan heads to the bar, and this time, Beverly is there. He explains that he wants to talk more about his friend Evans, so Beverly cranks up the music and asks him to dance with her. She then tells him that they have to talk quietly, as there are mics under the bar stools. And to answer his question, Beverly reveals that she had also planned to escape this wretched town before, and her accomplice was none other than Evans. He had elaborated the escape plan in his notebook, which was supposedly flawless. However, on the day of his escape, he was caught and killed. Hearing all this, Ethan asserts that he can find the notebook and leaves the bar. Following this, he goes to the Ballinger toy shop, which Kate and her husband Harold own. He confronts her alone and demands to know what's going on. But just like the previous time, Kate doesn't reveal anything, fearing that they are being watched. Before Ethan leaves, he sees a notice on the door, which reads a few instructions like, do not try to leave, do not discuss the past, and always answer the phone if it rings. Later, Ethan sneaks inside the town's morgue and successfully retrieves the notebook from his friend's corpse. Then he meets up with Beverly and shows her the map of the place, with the help of which they can escape. Hopeful, Beverly agrees to help him and removes a tracker that has been implanted inside his skin. It turns out that all the residents of Wayward Pines are administered with such trackers. After this, they stroll through the market, where they run into the Ballingers. Kate is happy that Ethan has found a partner, so she invites the two over for dinner the next evening. The next day, Ethan leaves his tracker inside his hotel room and wanders off. When he reaches the forest to hide the runaway supplies, he notices a man shooting at someone or something beyond the electric fence. However, Ethan doesn't pay much attention to it and leaves to meet Beverly. Outside her home, he explains that the dinner is going to be the perfect opportunity for them to escape. All Beverly has to do is enter the bathroom and hide her tracker there so that they can run away without a trace. Beverly agrees, but she is very nervous as her former partner Evans had also been caught. That night during dinner, as the two sets of couples are chatting, Ethan gets up and heads to the bathroom to inspect if there are any cameras. Unfortunately, while he is away, a nervous Beverly talks about her past life, which is a violation of the second rule. She tries to change the topic, but it seems as if the Ballingers have already caught wind of her intentions. Hence, as soon as Ethan returns, she hides her tracker in the bathroom and leaves with him. Outside, Beverly starts freaking out about the consequences if they get caught. Suddenly, all the telephones in the town begin to ring, and a large mob of people comes out to apprehend them. Ethan and Beverly run for their lives, but they are soon separated, and the latter is caught. Beverly is then dragged to the town square, where the sheriff and a large group is waiting for her. And as Ethan watches from a nearby building, the sheriff slices her throat, saying this is what happens when someone tries to escape. Here, we get to know that Beverly was reported to the sheriff by none other than the Ballinger couple. Later, Ethan shows up in Kate's kitchen and accuses her of participating in the murder. She tells him that Beverly's death was a reckoning, i.e. punishment for not following the rules. And as the kettle boils, Kate quietly confides that she was forced to turn them in, or else she and her husband would get reckoned. On the other hand, Ethan's wife Teresa is worried that he hasn't returned for a week. She tries asking for help from Ethan's boss, Adam, but the latter simply informs her that they're on the case, and that it might take some time. Hence, left with no options, Teresa and her son Ben arrive at the Secret Service Field headquarters in Boise, Idaho, where Ethan had last checked in before his disappearance. Covertly logging into an office computer, Teresa finds a trail leading them to the town of Wayward Pines. However, when the duo approaches the place, 
this, Sheriff Pope pulls them over and cunningly sabotages their car under the pretext of fixing an oil leak. Back in Wayward Pines, Ethan tries to escape the place by stowing away in a milk truck that surprisingly has a Wyoming license plate. But, unfortunately, he finds himself in a space-age supply depot where someone has stored the cars of those who have found their way to Wayward Pines. Ethan also finds his wife's damaged car among the pile, which is completely covered in dust. This indicates that the car has been there for quite a few years. But before he can investigate, the sheriff finds him and knocks him out with a sedative. Ethan wakes up at the hospital, where Nurse Pam informs him that his family has been discharged. She also tells him about their new home, which turns out to be Beverly's previous home. Wasting no time, Ethan rushes to the place and finally reconvenes with his family. However, he doesn't tell them much and again ventures out to find answers. Shortly after, he reaches the local station, where he finds Nurse Pam and the sheriff in a deep discussion. Ethan immediately confronts the sheriff for being a criminal, and the two almost get to blows. But just then, the phone rings, and when Pam picks it up, someone on the other side instructs the sheriff to stand down. Because of this, Ethan realizes the two are not in charge, and he leaves. He then meets Kate in a secluded part of the woods, and presses her for more information. Kate reveals that she was taken aback to find Evans in the place, but before she could interact with him, he was killed. Now the best way to survive in this town is to play along. As the two continue talking, Ben spots them and assumes that they're having an affair. He quickly rushes home and reports it to his mother, and in a fit of rage, Teresa decides to leave her husband and the town. Shortly after, Ethan returns home only to find an empty house with his wife's wedding ring on the counter. His family is walking down the road, trying to leave Wayward Pines. Suddenly, the sheriff arrives in his car and stops them, mentioning that no one can leave without his permission. When Ben tries to revolt, he is viciously assaulted by the devious sheriff. But before he could attack Teresa, Ethan arrives from behind and tackles him to the ground. An intense fight ensues, which finally ends with Ben running over the sheriff with his own car. Following this, Ethan shoots him dead and grabs his keys. He also finds a remote that opens a large door in front of them. As the family gets inside the car, a frightening growl is heard, and something runs out from the other side of the fence and grabs Sheriff Pope's body. Terrified, Ethan quickly shuts the door with the remote and drives away with his family. After they again reach Wayward Pines, Ethan stops the car and takes his son out to calm him down. Then he gets inside the car and reveals everything to his Teresa. He tells her about how the entire town is being surveilled and that there is no way to escape. He also tells her how he ended up here and in turn, Teresa also shares her experience. Meanwhile, a guy approaches Ben outside and hands him a uniform and a letter. Teresa nervously reads it, which states that Ben has to attend school starting the next day. Not wanting any trouble till a solution is found, Ethan suggests that his family play along. The next morning, Ethan heads to the sheriff's station to steal some guns. However, as he is about to leave, the town's mayor Brad Fisher and some photographers arrive to congratulate him on becoming the new sheriff of the town. It turns out that if someone kills a person in this town, they automatically take their job position. Ethan is baffled by this, but nonetheless, he decides to act along. After everyone is gone, Ethan investigates the place and discovers a secret compartment on the floor. When he opens it, he finds a box which contains all the records of the townspeople. To his shock, all the people, including Mayor Brad, were actually living in a different city before ending up here. In the meantime, Nurse Pam arrives there with a man who has supposedly committed a sin by spraying blasphemous words on public property. She wants the new sheriff, Ethan, to reckon the man, but he is adamant on not doing that. Hence, he says he'll take care of it and sends her away. Elsewhere, Teresa and Ben arrive at the school, where they run into the head teacher, Megan Fisher. She is revealed to be Mayor Brad's wife. Megan quickly bonds with Ben and takes him to the classroom, promising to take care of him. During recess, she interrogates the boy and asks him some strange questions about where he came from. It seems as if she is trying to make Ben forget about his past life. Meanwhile, at the sheriff's station, Ethan talks to the criminal, John, and learns that he too has become tired of the town. John reveals that he ended up in Wayward Pines in 2001, and from that day, he has tried to escape the place several times, but without any success. As the two talk, the phone suddenly rings, and when Ethan picks it up, a woman on the other side orders him to reckon John the next day. At night, Ethan shares the entire ordeal with Teresa and claims that Mayor Brad was acting strangely, as if he was hiding something. Hence, the couple plan to set up a dinner with the Fishers so that they can find some information about the place. Acting on the plan, Teresa approaches Megan the next morning at school and invites her and the mayor over for dinner at her house. However, the latter wants to meet in a neutral place, so they settle for a crowded restaurant in the market. That night, Ethan and Teresa meet the Fishers, where Nurse Pam, the Ballingers, and several other residents are all dining. Teresa cleverly takes Megan to the washroom, and when they are alone, Ethan tries to press the mayor for answers, but the old man doesn't divulge anything.
everything. After the failed dinner, Ethan escorts his wife home and then heads to the station. There, he tells John to get ready as he is letting him go free in the woods. Surprisingly, John doesn't want to escape as he knows that he has very little chance of surviving. Despite this, Ethan forces him to come with him. The two soon arrive near the fence which is guarded by high voltage current and Ethan tells John to go away but the latter is hesitant. He doesn't want anyone to get in trouble because of him so he decides to sacrifice himself. He shows Ethan a nearby hill from which one can escape the town and then sticks himself to the electric fence killing him instantly. Although devastated Ethan returns home with a plan in mind. There he tells Teresa everything about what happened and in return she reveals that she's been called up for a new job the next morning. Ethan is happy that his wife has gained the trust of some people in the town. Following this, he grabs some weapons and heads back to the forest. The episode ends as Ethan somehow scales the steep hill, and when he reaches the top, a mysterious humanoid-like figure lurks at him from the shadows. To see what happens next, watch the second part. <laughs>